Oh, man. Thank you, choir. I don't need it today. So, first of all, it seems right that I should thank Jeff and Maggie for reading today. Hello, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> because these were both very long stories, and God bless Maggie for uh, pronouncing all of those ancient places. <laughs> So thank you for listening to these two long stories. I know, I know they were long, but every now and then it's not a bad idea for us to listen to the fullness of a story. And what you heard today are two Pentecost stories. One in ancient times with the disciples and the followers of Jesus, and one in more recent times, 47 years ago, uh, at an MCC general conference when we were only three years old and already starting to plan our exit. Did you hear that? So on this day, these Pentecost stories are important. Why? Because Pentecost Sunday is the birthday of the church. On some level, we should be having, you know, party hats and whistles, you know, because it is the birthday of the church. It's a celebration. It's a time to contemplate life like many of us do on our own birthday. And so I want us to do that today together. Especially I want us to think about the story we heard from Scripture. I want you to put it in the context in which it was happening. This was not long after Jesus had died and then risen from the dead. It wasn't long after they'd seen Jesus walk through walls and appear out of nowhere. And I see them as it's described in in Scripture as being in an upper room. Does that sound familiar? In an upper room. And they were crowded together. In this Scripture, it says that there were the disciples, the ones that we know by name. And then there were other disciples, perhaps, that we don't know by name. There were women and men. There were family members, the mother of Jesus, Mary, and Mary Magdalene. There were children in this room. And they're there and hovered together trying to figure out what is next because Jesus is not here with us. What's next? And they are praying. And they're huddled together still a little bit afraid about what to do next. And all of a sudden, there is this loud noise and the rushing of a wind through the room. And in that moment, despite the fact that they came from all different countries, kinds of places. You heard them listed. They begin to speak in their native tongues, but everybody could understand it. I imagine that those followers of Jesus that day felt that their bones were dry. But the rushing of the mighty wind came and breathed life in that moment, and the church was born. Please pray with me. Holy One, we give you thanks for the sounds of the wind, for sounds of babies, for all the sounds of your presence with us. And now I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might rise up to meet you and that you will be pleased. May it be so in your many names and in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. So I imagine that if you look back over your life and think about all your birthdays, for some of us that's a longer look than others, <laughs> but when we look back at our birthdays, we could identify that there are some that were awesome. We remember a great party or we remember a great surprise. And then there are others that are the so not so good years of our birthday. We could mark them probably very easily the not so good birthday. I'm reminded of my own beloved Kate this last year who had a birthday like that. Because right around her birthday in December, her best friend of 41 years was diagnosed with stage four liver cancer and 10 days later, he died. That will always be a not so good year, birthday, always. So we all have them. And I believe you could make a case that the Christian church today, in this moment, is having a not-so-good birthday. You could make a case for it because 
Churches, Christian churches, are in decline everywhere. And it is also true in MCC. You could make an argument that the impact of the church anymore is not always a good impact. You could make a case that the way people on the outside of the church look in and see the church is not all that great. Because they see us not walking our talk. They see us talking a lot inside buildings, but maybe not doing so much outside buildings. You could make a case that this is a not so good birthday year. Locally, right here at Church of the Trinity. We could make a case that we're not having a very good birthday year. We have been in decline too. Praise God, we're showing a little bit of an increase. Amen? Amen. Amen. You could still make a case that this is not so good of a birthday. You could make a case that we are not reaching 20 to 40 year olds. You could make a case that because we're not reaching those generations, we're also not reaching children, but thank God we have one here today. (laughs) You could make a case that our impact has waned as LGBTQ rights have gotten better for us in this country. And we've lost our passion somehow for standing with those in the margins. You could make a case for all of that. But I'm going to stand here today and say I beg to differ. I beg to differ that we ought to make that kind of case. But rather, we ought to revisit the real meaning and the real impact of Pentecost. I imagine most of our mothers wish wish we would revisit the real impact of birthing us. (laughs) I imagine they would like it if we would stop and consider our celebration and think about what they went through for us to have a celebration on our birthday. The meaning of birth, the meaning of new life, and the meaning of how actual birth of a human happens. It is an unsolved mystery in many ways, how human birth actually can happen. Because it's amazing. So in the spirit of Pentecost, I want to make a new case today. Not a not so bad year. Not a, not a very good year kind of case. And I think it's in the Pentecost story. Not only the one in scripture, but the one for MCC. And I want us to let it breathe new life into our dry bones. That spirit is one that blows through and it is our source and it is our force. I want you to walk out of here today saying that mantra. The Holy Spirit is our source and it is our force. It has the power to do both things, as few things in the world have the power to do. So it is our source. That day in that room, hovered and afraid and praying, praying for some understanding of what was next. Do you think that's where we are? Praying for some understanding about what is next? Yes. All of a sudden, the source showed up. And let's talk about the source, the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Well, in Scripture, there is a lot to learn about the Holy Spirit and how it's referred to. For example, the source is referred to constantly in the creation story. So the Spirit as a source is a source of creativity. Do we need that for a new day? Yes, we need creativity, which means we need the Spirit to work with us and in us. It is the source of creating, of making something new, of pulling something out of nowhere and making it something. It is also the source of our own ability to understand that which is not usually understandable. The Spirit is the source of that. Because in the Pentecost story, Just like the MCC Pentecost story, when people started to pray in their native languages, 
or speaking in tongues as a spiritual gift, everyone understood it. I wonder what's happening at the U.S. border today where people are speaking a lot of different languages and we need to understand them. The Spirit is our source. You see? The Spirit is the one that gives us that power and that ability to hear and understand that which we would normally miss and not understand. The Spirit is the source of our ability to heal. Not in and of ourselves, but in collaboration with the Spirit, there is healing. That is the source that we work with. The Bible speaks of this source all the time. In Judaism, it speaks of it as the Shekinah glory. And often the Shekinah glory is spoken of, like we speak of the Holy Spirit, as the thing that comes in and sort of clears out the way and clears out the space so that we're able to connect with God. That is the source that is the Holy Spirit. And then there is the force. The force of the Holy Spirit. The force that can walk right through anything and make it different and make it new. It is the force that can help us to not be selfish, but to be compassionate. Now, I know that some of you get sideways with each other sometimes. And some of you get sideways with me sometimes. Right? Amen? Let's be honest. Yeah. And... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so when we get sideways with each other, because we live in community together, we will, the force of the Holy Spirit says, if you will lean into me a little bit, I will help you to see the person you're sideways with in a very different way. I'll help you to see them as someone who I love. I'll help you to see them as someone who deserves your compassion. I'll help you to see that they deserve the deepest love you can offer them. Now, we don't always do that, amen? That is not usually or necessarily our way of moving into conflicts and disagreements and places where we don't agree. But the Spirit is a force to be dealt with if we call on. The Spirit is a force to help us be filled with something other than what we see a lot around us, which is hate and violence. We see people who are hungry. We see people who are still treated with hate because of the color of their skin or because of their gender identity or because of their class. There are all sorts of ways that the Spirit can move into those situations through us. Here's the thing. What good is that force if we're not in those situations? If we aren't out there finding those places to be, what good is the force? The force in this room has its place. But that is not where the Holy Spirit is most powerful. It's in those upper rooms with people who are scared. It's in those rooms, upper rooms with people who are hungry, with people who do not know the way to go. They feel lost. That is the force of the Spirit and where the Spirit is most alive. For our purposes here on this Pentecost Sunday, on our own birthday as one of the Christian churches in the world, the force says, I've got something new for you. The force of the Spirit says, I'm going to come and blow through here like something you've not ever felt. 
on the hottest summer day in South Florida. I'm going to blow through so you can't miss it. I'm going to light a fire so you can't miss it. But you know what? We miss it all the time. We miss it all the time because we're not paying attention. That day in the upper room, the followers of Jesus sort of put aside in some way their greatest fears and decided to pray and decided to pay attention. And when they paid attention, they heard the loud noise. They could feel the wind coming through. But you know what was most important? They felt the fire in their belly. The fire in their belly about Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit was going to do on this birthday. On this birthday. I feel today that there is something at this church, this one, not another church, this one, that we have that is uniquely ours to do. Do you believe that? Well, that didn't sound like you believe it. <laughs> that was a little weak. So we work on that. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't believe that God is ready for us to shut our doors and go cry in the corner because we have some decline. I don't believe that in our roots as MCC there is one single thing that suggests that we ought to lie down and just wait until we die. I don't believe that it was in the mind and heart of Reverend Elder Troy Perry, who after being faced with the desire to commit suicide, got up off his suicide bed because God told him, go tell my children that I love them, all of them. Yes. And he did it. <laughs> How many of us have heard it, but we didn't go do it? He did it. So there is nothing in our history that suggests that we ought to just lay back and not get ready. But rather, that the Spirit has the power to keep giving us breath into our dry bones. I am so hopeful. I am so jazzed at the possibility that God will do something with this congregation that you in your wildest imagination can't get your head around. Because that is the mystery of the Spirit. It's the mystery of the source and the force that is in us and around us. There is a miracle awaiting as soon as we open ourselves up to the Spirit. It becomes just about that simple. I want to tell you about a story of another upper room. Some years ago, my friend and colleague Reverend, colleague, Reverend Elder Ken Martin, went to Pakistan. And while he was there, he met these six Pakistani women. They were Christian, but they also all, despite the fact that they were adults, lived with their families because in that country and in that culture, the women were not allowed to leave their family home until they married married a, a man. And so they had such great desire to not only be together but to worship that those six women would sneak out of their homes in the middle of the night and they found this upper room, literally, where they would meet. And they would put black cloths over the windows because being caught would have meant their death. Can you imagine wanting to worship that much? That if your life was on the line, you would do it anyway? Can you even imagine that? And so these six women would gather, and Reverend Ken was able to go with them to that, up, that upper room and share a prayer and some singing with them. Those six Pakistani women, by Sharia law, could have been and would have been killed by their fathers because it was required under Sharia law that if they were caught, not just worshiping, 
but caught because they were lesbians, they would be put to death. These six women had a plan. I have to imagine that in their praying in that dark upper room, sometime or other, the spirit swept in. And their plan was that the one thing that they would allow Pakistani women to do in order to support themselves was to go to beauty school. And so they decided they would raise enough money somehow to send one to beauty school. That one would come back and start a business and earn enough money to send the second one. And then the third one, until they were all educated at least in a way that they could earn a living and then they could leave their parents home. The first one was in school when Reverend Ken was there. And he came back home to tell this story. In just a few days, we raised $10,000 MCC worldwide to send to those six women. All six of them were able to go to beauty school quickly. You know what? There was never a brick and mortar church built in that little place in Pakistan. Because that didn't really matter, did it? No. What mattered is that those women could be safe, they could be together, they could earn their own living, and they could worship together. What the Spirit was doing there is not what we would have made up in our minds. Because what we would have made up was the same old story, which is, oh, let's go make a church out of that. Let's go build a building for them. And I'm not saying that that's necessarily a bad thing. I am saying that there is a lot the Spirit wants to do with us that looks different, that invites us to be in the creative source with the Spirit to discover it. Do those women matter? Do they? Yes. The Spirit thought so. Does their life matter? The Spirit thought so. And there are women and men. There are people of all gender identities and sexual orientations. There are women and men and our siblings all over this city who need us to imagine something different and something new. On this our birthday, I hope that we will sit in the middle of the rushing of the mighty wind. And that there will be no mistake that decline is not our story, but hope and love and a force that will not let us go. Not ever. May it be so. Amen. Amen. Amen.